uh, crop damage. Um, what is, um, and actually, they are an emerging pest worldwide. Um, the populations are increasing everywhere in the world, and we, we are seeing them uh, in Europe, in Australia, in uh, the United States, everywhere. Okay, so they can affect a wide variety of crops, and here you can see you have carrots, um, cabbage, corn, um, and potatoes. Um, they're most damaging to, to um, uh, root crops because, because of the, um, the damage that they cause and they can render them unmarketable. Okay, I don't know what I'm doing here, but okay, they're very difficult to control. And uh, now just a little bit of difference between wire worms and millipedes. Um, uh, millipedes are, um, these are, the wire worms are kind of brown in color, yellowish brown. Whereas the millipedes, they're black and they curl. So if you, see, if you see worms in your field, you just have to make sure that they are actually wire worms and not something else. And sometimes if your soil is really good, if you have um, nice organic matter in your soil, you end up with um, these white worms. They are actually related to um, earthworms. So they're, they're, quite, they're good to have in your field. I have no idea what I'm doing here. Yeah. yeah. Like this? Towards you? Okay. No. <laughs> I'm turning. Okay. Good. Sorry. Thank you. Right. Ah, that's better. Okay. That's better. So now we, so there's white worms. So the type of damage that they do, I, I was mentioning that there's several crops. So you can see this is cabbage, and they've eaten all the cabbage transplants. Uh, scorn, this field actually, the grower had to plow this field in because it was so badly damaged, he just plowed it in. That's Cranby, and you can see big patches here where wire worms have eaten, eaten the, the crop. Carrots, you have them feeding on carrots, onions, and, the, and uh, potatoes. And this is actually from a farmer's field. He had to plow this field in because it was so badly damaged. So you can see they cause a lot of damage to, to different crops. So, life cycle. Now, Wire worms, they, they emerge, the click beetles emerge in the spring. They will lay their eggs in the soil, the larvae hatch, and then they start feeding on the seeds and seedlings what, that are planted in the spring. Then later on, uh, when the soil dries out in the summer, they'll go a little bit deep into the ground, like not very deep, but just a little bit down. And then they come back up in the fall, and that's when they start eating on the root crops and, and also on other crops, but, they'll, but they damage your root crops. And then what happens is then later in the fall, they will go deep down into the ground to hibernate. And this hibernation pattern, and they come back up to the, in the spring, this continues for a period of two to six years, depending on your species that you have in your, in your field. So once eggs are laid in your field, you have the larva living in the soil, depending on the species, two to, two to six years. After that, they will pupate, and then they become adults again, and the cycle continues. You can see what, how damaging they could be. Um, so in Ontario, there are 172 species of click beetles, but not all of them are pests, just a few are pests. Lemonia sagonis is, a, is one of the species that is a pest. And then you also have some of the others here uh, that are mentioned, and these are also uh, pest species. So it's very important to know what species you have in your, in your field. Now, where do they prefer to lay their eggs? This is where it becomes very tricky. Uh, because they like undisturbed fields with a lot of green plant material, something like a sod field. 
just because the eggs will, when they, when they lay their eggs, it's nice and moist, the, the, the area is moist, the soil remains moist under green material, and also uh, the, uh, the eggs, uh, when they hatch, the larvae have food. They have plenty of food there, so they really like sod fields. Uh, they like uh, underseeded fields. Um, our growers, they underseed barley to um, red clover, so we do have them in the underseeded fields. We have them in pasture fields. Once again, there's enough food all year round. They have food, so they're really happy. And I've also seen them laying eggs in bare soil. Um, the problem with bare soil is the eggs can be compromised because if the bare soil dries out, the eggs dry out, the young larvae dry out, okay? So why are they difficult to control? One of the, one of the uh, problems is this really long life cycle. Because they are, you, 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 have to, you have to basically kill them every year. They have such a long life cycle that they're there in your field for four or five years. Our species is there for five years. Uh, they're soil dwelling, so we don't know where they are in the soil profile, so how do you, how do you attack them? because you don't know where they are, where they really are in the soil profile. They're very difficult to monitor. They have an aggregated distribution in the field, so there are, they are in different areas in your field. And if you monitor, you, you may miss them, just because they are aggregated. Uh, there are several generations in the same field. By this I mean every year you have beetles flying in and laying eggs. So you would have one-year-old, two-year-old, three-year-old, four-year-old larva in your field at the same time. Uh, the damage occurs in the spring and the fall. So unlike other insects that you have, uh, that they come in, they'll, they'll do the damage, and then you can control them, you can spray them and control them. These ones do damage twice. So in the spring, if you plant a spring crop, they are feeding on your spring crop. If you plant a a crop that you harvest in the fall, like uh, rutabagas and uh, uh, potatoes and carrots, they're damaging that crop as well. So what crop do you, do you plant? And they have a really um, wide variety of plants that they feed on. And this is what makes it so difficult to really control this insect because of this wide variety of plants that they, that they feed on. So because of this long life cycle, I just want to come back to this. Because of this long life cycle, if you do something in year one, it's not sufficient. Because you'll kill some of them, but you're not going to kill all of them. So you have to do something every year, every year. This is the challenge that we have for, uh, to control wireworms. Because you have to do something that, that uh, is reducing this population that's coming out and laying more eggs. So the, the, that's the goal is to try to reduce that population. So changing gears a little bit, because of this five year, we have to do it every year, we have to start using an integrated pest management approach. And the emphasis is on integrated here, integrated pest management. So in order to do an integrated pest management approach, you have to have a monitoring you usually use thresholds, you use chemical control, cultural controls, uh, mechanical control, uh, resistant varieties, biological control, and molecular techniques. So this is the general IPM strategy that you, that, you, that you have for every insect, for every disease. For insects, generally, this is what we, we, we focus on this, this portion. We do have some rotation crops. We do use chemical, biological controls. But generally, what we focus on is monitoring thresholds and chemical control. But this insect has challenged us because we have to do something every year. So I'm just going to go through what tools do we have right now at this time that you can use in our toolbox that you can integrate together and use it. That's what I'm going to focus on. So let's see for monitoring. Monitoring, you can use bait traps to monitor the larva. And you can use uh, traps like pheromone traps or the light trap to monitor the adults. 
So it, it depends when you have to monitor. Usually you monitor in the spring and the fall for, for these insects, and you have to have at least 15 bait stations per acre because of their aggregated distribution. So just uh, there are many different baits that are out there that work for wire ones. I'm going to talk to you about what we use just because it's a lot easier to use. It's a carrot bait, so you don't have to prepare it in advance and have it ready to go. If you decide one day, coming in and say, oh, I, have, I can uh, go out and bait my fields today, you just have to go buy a bag of carrots and you'll be okay to go and bait your field. So this is what our growers are, are using. So what we did was we have, um, this is just an exhaust pipe. We just cut a piece of exhaust pipe and we um, welded it to a metal bar and that's what we use as our probe. So we make a hole in the ground, put a, put a flag, um, put some carrots, chopped up carrots, we chop it up into little pieces, um, place the soil back into, the, into that hole, lightly pack it, and then seven days later we go back and we remove the bait from the, uh, from the, from the soil. We take the, the, pull the bait the probe out, put, put the soil into a plastic bag, and then we, uh, we check to see if there's any carrots left in the hole. We just dig them out, okay? And then we put everything into a plastic bag. Now that plastic bag, if you do it in the fall, you can just put the soil and the bag of soil in, in a fridge or in a cold room, leave it there, and when you are ready to, to look at it over the winter, when it's uh, low time, you're not so busy, then you can look through your bag your baits. You count the wire worms, here you can see the threshold. One to two wire worms per bait. It's very, very low. So you, you have to do something about it. Now I have this statement in here because if you go too early in the spring, you won't find wire worms. If you go too late in the fall, you won't fi find wire worms because they've gone down into the ground deeper. So and if you haven't put enough baits in your field, again, you run into a problem because you don't know, uh, you, you may have wire worms, but you think you don't have wire worms. So you can see the challenge that this, this insect uh, has given us to solve, and then it has an aggregated distribution. So because of that aggregated distribution, you really need to put baits out in your field everywhere, like really a, a, a a random distribution of your baits. And the best time to do it is early in, uh, is in the spring. I think June is a May, end of May, June is a good time. Or you could do it in the, in the fall just prior to planting and, I, and September is a good time for that. Okay, insecticides. I'm talking about potatoes here. We have some insecticides that are registered for potatoes. We have thymid, which is an infero uh, granule application. Clothianidin is registered, but you know we, uh, all the neonics are under reeval right now, so I don't know how long it's going to be with us. Uh, capture is another insecticide that was had conditional registration uh, for British Columbia and uh, Prince Edward Island. I'm not sure if it has actually gotten a full registration for everywhere, so I think it's only registered for PEI for now. It might have gotten a full registration. So there are insecticides that you can use. Cultural cult control techniques, crop rotation. Now, wire worms feed on so many different crops, but what do you use? That was our, our question, how do you control them? What do you use to, to put in there so that they don't have good food? So we came up with two crops. One was brown mustard and buckwheat. Uh, those were the two crops that we came up with. Now, with wire worms, they, are, they feed in the spring, they feed in the fall. So you have to have the crop there at both times of the year because they feed at two times in the year. So we, well, we are challenged because these are short season crops. Plant them in June. The growers did not want 
us to, uh, at that time, they didn't, they, they were, they're kind of concerned about having brown mustard grow as a weed. If you, if you allow it to grow, it's going to become a weed, even buckwheats, they were concerned. So we said, okay, we are going to, going to work it into the ground before it turns a weed and plant a second crop. So we were planting two crops, two years, two crops, really bad fields, very, very heavy infestation of wireworms. And these are the results that we got. As you can see here, the number of holes per tuber, if you have for brown mustard and buckwheat, as compared to if you had barley. We didn't see that much in, there's not, no significant difference between the total and marketable yield. And the, um, the tons per acre were, uh, for the processing industry was, uh, for the, was uh, higher as compared to barley. So why brown mustard? Brown mustard has a chemical, all mustards have a chemical called glucosinolate, but brown mustard has an allele glucosinolate in there. And that's, that, that's the factor that actually comes, that allele glucosinolate. Um, so when we have our, uh, you have your cells, in your cells of the brown mustard, you have an enzyme called myronase, that's the enzyme, and you have the glucosinolate, and they're separated in the cell. As soon as you break down that cell, a reaction happens between the enzyme and the glucosinolate, and it produces this, this uh, isothiocyanate, which is actually like, acts as a biofumigant. Now, it might be killing some of the young wireworms as a biofumigant, but I don't think it kills the larger wireworms because I have found that they move, as soon as they sense it, they move down into the ground. So it may not be killing them. And the brown mustard, in addition to the allele glucosinolate, it also has a 2-phenylethyl in its roots, which is toxic to the insect. So if the insect comes and eats it, it kind of get, it gets sick, doesn't like it. So, and when a plant is, is chewed, as soon as the roots start to get chewed, what happens is that the, the plant produces more of this, this chemical. So that, that's, the, that's the thing about brown mustard. So it's very important to use Brassica juncea brown mustard. Now you will hear people saying we used Ethiopian mustard, yellow mustard, um, caliente mustard, or white mustard. Those don't have that 2 phenylethyl in its roots, and it doesn't have the allele glucosinolate. So they don't get the results, and they said mustard doesn't work. But we have used it repeatedly, and our growers are using it. There was 25,000 acres of mustard grown on the island this year, because especially for wireworms. So there, there is the, we are seeing the results, but if you use the wrong mustard, you're not going to get the results. And we had buckwheat. Now, we don't know why buckwheat works. We're not sure, but it does work. I have used it several times, and it is giving us that the wireworm suppression, damage suppression. We are trying to figure out why, how it works and why it works. We think that we have managed to, our chemists have managed to extract a, a, a specific compound from its roots. And we think what's happening is that the, when the insect eats it, it kind of does something internally to it so it stops eating. And we think then it, it kills them after that. So we're, just try we're still trying to find out how buckwheat works. So we grew it for two years. Um, now the growers are doing something different. We are still working on it. We're trying to tweak the system. But you do need fertilizer just because, you know, depending on the soil, uh, soil analysis, it's because you want a healthy plant there. When, when you are, for the insect to feed on it, you need that plant to be a healthy plant. So you plant it in early June, that's what we are doing. And then because we didn't want it to go to seed, we, um, we disked it in, in late July, before the seeds matured. And this is what we did. Nothing special, nothing too fancy. We just went in and we disk, disked the crop in. And then after two to three weeks, we, um, we harrowed it a little bit, and then we 
didn't add any more fertilizer because what you put in in the spring was enough. And we uh, planted the second crop. Now this second crop, the reason for the second crop is because they come up in September to eat. All insects will eat a huge amount uh, at that time because they have to actually um, process uh, and build fat to, 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 um, to spend the winter. So they really need that, that fat. So they come and they eat a lot. And we found September is a good time. So we need a crop there that's growing, that's healthy crop in September. Uh, so uh, we want the crop to be established. And the second crop in PEI, it doesn't need to be disc, disc thin or anything because it doesn't produce seed. It'll go to flower, but it doesn't have the, the, the uh, temperature units to actually go to seed. So we just lay, left it as a cover crop. Now this whole process has challenged us because it's soil conservation also, because we're working the soil in the summer. And we didn't want to do that. There's two things. It was for soil conservation purposes. And the other, other aspect was that it's expensive to put out two crops, to grow twice, you know, like in one year. You're putting out, you have to grow the crop, you have to buy the seed. So it's expensive. So we had, so we did, looked at something, alter, un, alternative approaches. And what we're, we, I worked with the farmers, and what we found was if you mow the crop uh, to six to eight inches, it, it doesn't really grow. The higher you mow it, the more it will grow. But it'll, it'll stay there. It'll still be living. Sometimes you have to make sure that it, it, you may have to clip it again, because if it starts to grow, if you cut it too high, it starts to grow, and then you're going to have um, seeds being produced. So you don't want that. So you can mow it. And the results that we got in one of the farmer's fields, and he just did it for one year. He didn't do it for two years, one year. That was also one of our things that we were trying to figure out. And you can see the number of holes per tuber is significantly less. But if it was clipped, incorporated, or seed, we didn't have any significant differences. So that's what your mustard crop should look like. That's what your wheat crop should look like. And the bottom line for this approach is treat your, treat your mustard and buckwheat as a crop. Because some farmers, they, they didn't put any fertilizer in, and then the crop wasn't very good, so they didn't get the results that they, was, that they should have gotten. So other benefits that growers are seeing right now, they're finding that they have less verticillium in their fields. Uh, they do have less nematodes in there, uh, disease nematodes, because they're battling. Those are the two other issues that our growers in PEI are battling. Uh, they did find that they have um, it's good, better soil quality and health and better yield. However, when growing a rotation crop, you do have to make sure that, that you are looking at diseases, because some of these rotation crops do share diseases with, uh, with your cash crop, for example. With brown mustard, it does, it's susceptible to sclerotinia. So if you have a field that, is, that has a lot of sclerotinia in it, you are not going to go in with mustard. You're going to go in with something else. So that's an aspect that you have to think about. Now, resistant varieties is in 20 different varieties. Russet Burbank, which is one of the uh, one of the varieties that we use, is also um, it's it had quite a, quite a lot of damage on it. Now we get to mechanical control. We do have pheromone traps, but the pheromone traps only trap be uh, male beetles because their pheromones are chemicals that are given out by females to attract the males. And uh, we only have the pheromones are, uh, this, these traps will only catch pheromones of beetles of the European species. You don't have those European species there. We have them. So you don't have those here. So really, these traps are not going to really work very well for you. We do have the Nell traps that were recently come out with. Um, it's not species specific. And what's the most important thing is that it, it attracts the females. So what, how the NELT works is it has the solar-powered spotlight and a cup in, cup in the ground, which is filled with water with a few drops of, uh, of soapy soap in there. And this is what it looks like in, at night. Uh, and during the day, it acts as a passive trap. 
So any beetles walking around on the soil are going to fall in during the day. In the night, it's actually attracting them. And what it does is it attracts them to the light. They come and they fall into, this, into the trap, and that's it. And the main thing is catching those females. That was the main objective for this, is to trap those females. So if you trap the females, egg-laying females, you reduce your egg population, you reduce your larval population, and that's how the whole system works. Uh, you have the cage around. The cage is mainly just to prevent other critters from getting in, like mice and voles, because then it becomes really disgusting to remove those, to go through those traps. It's horrible. Um, the other reason for these traps was that, you remember I told you the sod fields, pasture fields, they all have wire worms in them. And they're, they, those are source, source fields. So if they have wire worms, the adults are coming out, they're moving into your other fields. So you have to somehow stop them from doing that. And how do you do it in a pasture field? A pasture field should remain a pasture field. You need to feed your cattle. So you have to leave it as a pasture field. So um, these traps would come in handy there. That's what the thinking is behind these traps, that you can actually put them not only in your fields, but you can also put them in these pasture fields. Now, we did use this, so what it looks like at night. It's kind of cold to go around and see. I'd love to see it from the space station, but <sighs> someday. Um, so well, we, we, we put these traps out at the, the, um, the first year that we did it. It was a four hectare field, and we had it in just one corner of the, of the field. We had these 10 traps. And um, as you can see here, we found 9,362 beetles. But what was really good is what, that we were finding a lot of females in these traps. And we were finding other species as well. So that was really good. But then we thought, OK, now how is that going to be? How is a grower going to use this? Because it has to be something that a grower could use in his field while still doing all his work in growing his crop. So we thought, OK, let's look at how we could do this. So we put these traps out along the edge. Now, we had bit fall traps in there just as a comparison. Usually, it's about 15, 15 meters between the traps, but here we had it at 10 meters. And we put a strip in the center of the field as well. So it's about maybe two feet. It's a strip that you can leave in the center of your field. And then you can work around all this area, and it shouldn't be a problem to grow your crop or work, what to spray, whatever you want to do. The traps go out for two months only, at the beginning of May to the end of June. Here, you might have to put them a little bit earlier because of your weather here. It's so nice and warm. Um, so what did we find? We found in the field, field traps, we had uh, 1,699 beetles. And we found uh, 1,000 of those were females that we took out of that population. And in the hedge, again, we found over 1,000 beetles, and we had, uh, we had uh, similar numbers of males and females in the hedge. So overall, we did this in seven different fields. As you can see here, there's large numbers that we were taking out of, of these, uh, these fields. So this trap is really helping us, and we are going to be using it in more, uh, in more fields. We're going to be looking at it in different settings and try to figure it out. Now, if any of you are interested, you know you have wire worms and are interested in testing the, the trap out here, I would be very happy to work with you guys. Um, I do want to see if, uh, how well it works on your species here, because you have other species. So I want to see how well it works and how many does it catch. But we need fields that definitely we know have wire worm issues in them, OK? So let's go to the integrated approach. So now we have all these tools that I showed you that we have separately, that we looked at all separately. So how do we integrate them into a system that you can use in your fields? So the first thing is monitor the field. You have to monitor your field to see if you even have wire worms in your field, because a lot of times it may be something else that's doing the damage. So you need to know what your population is and if you have wire worms. 
if you do decide to put a cash crop in that first year, you have to put a cash crop, which is, if you can, put a resistant variety that just helps you out. I know sometimes that's not an option because you're selling to uh, a processor, so that may not be an option, but if you can, that would be a good way to do it. Uh, you use your chemical, you use your use your chemical because that's going to get rid of some of your some of your insects, and you start trapping these adults. The second year, you depending on your population. If you have a very high population, you might want to use a uh, you, uh, use a, a suppressive crop this following year. If not, then you can go with your normal crop and use a suppressive crop just for one year. But you have to continue with this trapping because any beetles coming out, any beetles coming into your field, you have to trap them to reduce this population. Year two, you do the same thing. You continue. One of these years, you have to use a suppressive crop. And you continue with your trapping and your monitoring. And then in your, in your cash crop here, you can put your chemical in again. And you continue to trap. Because your chemical is only for for potatoes, you can only be used on potatoes. That's what, that's what your cash crop is. That's what you have your thymid there for that. So that's, that's, the, that's how you would use this integrated uh, pest management um, strategy in, in your fields. And eventually, your goal is you reduce these guys and you reduce these, the number of eggs in your field. So let's go back to our integrated pest management approach here. Um, so we had our, our monitoring, we had our thresholds, chemical control. Now we are continuing to search for new chemicals. We're continuing to check the efficacy of new chemicals and different ways of using these new chemicals. So research is continuing in this area. It's, it hasn't, we haven't stopped looking at, at chemicals because chemicals plays a role in uh, pest management. It does have a place in pest management. Uh, you do have your cultural con control. And once again, we haven't stopped at these two crops. We are looking at other crops, because there has to be other crops out there that are doing this. And one of the crops we're looking at is sorghum Sudan grass. We know sorghum Sudan grass is a good, it controls diseases. So can it also suppress wireworms? Can it do something for wireworms? So that's one of the crops we're looking at. And, and we're going to continue to look at different crops, because the more variety of crops you have, the better, for you, better that you can rotate with your, with your uh, cash crop. We, we have the mechanical control technique. So now we can use some, uh, some trapping. We can trap the adults. Uh, we can track, get the females out of the system. Uh, genetics, we have resistant cultivars. Now, we haven't stopped at just finding resistant cultivars. We are trying to figure out why are they resistant? Why are they less susceptible? What's the reason? And maybe we can actually put that into some of the more um, well-known varieties that are grown more than, more than the others. Biological control, my colleague in, uh, in British Columbia is looking at a biological control technique. And he is actually um, pretty close to having it. It's not registered yet. And that's why I didn't talk to you. I only talked to you about what you can use today. Uh, this is going to come out soon. As soon as he is ready and it gets registered, it might be another option. It will be another option that you can use. We're looking at molecular techniques, um, how to identify them. So they're very, very difficult to identify. Unless you have the adults, the larvae are really tough to identify. So molecular control techniques, there's also an RNAi technique that we are, that somebody is working on. So there is other research going on. And we're also looking at the biology. Now that we can trap these, uh, these the females, we can look at the biology. Because we don't know the species that you have here. How long is its life cycle? Is it two years? Is it four years? Is it six years? We don't know. So that's something that we need to, we need to look at. And now if we can trap the females, we can actually do that and actually look at the biology. So that's my team. We do have fun in the field sometimes, but uh, we, it's, it's, a, it's a really long job to, to, deal, 
to deal with wire worms. I do want to thank the, uh, my team, um, uh, the PI Potato Board and the uh, Hort Association Department of Agriculture, our funding agencies, as well as um, the growers. I have the pleasure of working with some really, really nice growers in PEI, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and um, it's been such a pleasure working with, uh, with growers, and you guys are so innovative. It's, uh, I, I'm so impressed with uh, the work that you'll do and how innovative you really are, so it's been a real pleasure working with them. And if you need, have any questions or if you do need to contact me, um, just any time, I'm always available to speak to you. Do we have any questions? Question cards? One that I may have for you is <clears throat> as we go on a journey to try and move away from the products that we have been using to control these, what's going to be our biggest challenge to getting there? Challenge with wireworms? As yes. You as an example, wireworms, but any other insect, as we start trying to change from here, we're going to use this product to control them to use this system to control them. What's going to be the biggest challenge? Uh, the biggest challenge is trying to fit everything in, to get everything into place into your system that you have, because every farm has its own system, and that's what I'm finding that the growers are the challenge is how do I fit it in? How do I fit this in and that in? And, and the other big challenge is the time that is involved with dealing with wireworms. To monitor wireworms, it's a really time consuming and it's a lot of work and that's the biggest challenge that I think we are facing. Okay, a couple questions here from the audience. Okay, can brown mustard uh, be harmful to beneficial soil insects? Um, we didn't see that. Um, maybe uh, if, if, you, if you just mow it, it's not going to be harmful to, to beneficials. If you work it in, it does have a biofumigant effect, so it might be harming some, in, some beneficials because it's a biofumigant. So you are going to see that. That's a trade-off that you have. Okay. Will a fall rain after a period of dry weather tend to bring wireworms to the surface to feed? If so, why? Sorry, could you repeat that? If a fall rain after a period of dry weather tends to bring wireworms to the surface, is that true, number one, and why is that, that it would happen? Why are they coming to the surface yes. in the fall? Yes. Um, in the fall, generally, it's, it's to feed. It's mainly to feed. Is that, that's the reason why they're coming to the surface. And um, if you, if, uh, and I'm trying to figure out a way that you can get them at that time. And right now we have the crops that, that we can use, but if there's a different way. And mainly it's to feed. They have to feed. All insects feed. If you, if, if for potato growers who will see uh, potato beetles, you'll see that potato beetles feed, feed voraciously in the fall. And that's, again, the reason for them feeding is because they have to obtain all that fat. So that's the main reason for them feeding in the fall. Okay. Uh, what happens or would happen if you haven't done this yet? What would happen if you took a half rate of brown mustard and a half rate of uh, buckwheat and planted them together? What do you think oh. would happen? I, I haven't done it, but I, I, I don't see why you cannot do it, and I don't see why you, it won't work. Sometimes buckwheat can be a suppressive crop, but um, uh, you know, it can suppress other crops from growing, but uh, buckwheat, uh, you, can, you can actually put them together. And our growers have tried it. Our growers have actually planted, uh, uh, they, they undersowed um, their barley with uh, brown mustard, um, and they, they got a really good crop of, of uh, barley because then they just went and killed the, killed the brown mustard. So you can put bus buckwheat and mustard together. If uh, that's what you want to try, you can try it. Okay. Uh, a final question here. In the NELT and pitfall trap study, did the traps capture other species of beetles? Did the traps capture other species of beetles? Yes, yes. The traps are catching many uh, other species as well. Uh, we did try them here, but I think it, by the time we sent them Last, uh, last year, by the time we sent them here, we didn't know, um, we didn't, um, 
it, it was kind of late for the wireworm, so we didn't have the beetles. But they do, the traps also catch some other species of beetles, and that's why the cage is around to protect the, the beneficial beetles. You have the ground beetles that are beneficial, so we want to tr uh, stop the beneficial beetles from going in. Now you're always going to have some casualties. There are the smaller ones that are going to go get in anyway, so you are going to catch other beetles as well. There was a second part to that question. And the fact that there was more, was there more captured in the hedgerows or in the open field? So depending where the traps were, did it make a difference on what was captured? Of, uh, depending on, no, I couldn't, uh, depending on the trap. The location of the trap, if it was in the field or in the fence row. No, it doesn't matter. Like I, when I put the trap out, no, it, uh, the location doesn't matter. You can put it out uh, in the field. The only thing is if you're putting it out in your sod field, you have to have a cleared area around, like at least a, a foot around the trap cleared so that the beetles can actually see it and because otherwise the, the sod just goes, grows right through the, the cage. So it's, um, yeah, it, 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 location doesn't matter as long as it's in the, in the field. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for taking our questions You're and welcome. interesting presentation. Our final speaker of the afternoon session is Steve LaRock. He's going to talk about building resilient farming systems.